Check it out, old man Marley. Who is he? You ever heard of the South Bend Shovel Slayer? No. That's him. Back in 58, he murdered his whole family and half the people on his block. Now it'll just be a matter of time before he does it again. Yeah! Look out! This is Robert's Blossom. He's probably best known as Old Man Marley in Home Alone, but this was just one job in a long, prosperous career as a dependable character actor that spanned over 40 years. I figured since we're getting close to the holidays, it would be a good idea to shed some light on Mr. Blossom's life. Robert Scott Blossom was born on March 25, 1924 in New Haven, Connecticut. His father, John Blossom, was an athletic director at Yale University. He attended Harvard for a year, but then he joined the Army and served in World War II in Europe around 1942. After returning from the war, he trained to become a therapist, but eventually changed his mind and decided to become an actor. He moved to New York and ended up acting in several off-Broadway productions, receiving three Obie Awards for his performances. He then moved up and acted in actual Broadway productions, which include Ballad of the Sad Cafe and Sam Shepard's Operation Sidewinder. His film and television career began in 1958 with an appearance in the crime drama Naked City. There's another Santa Claus out there! He's uh, out there in the middle of the street! He's out there ringing his bells and everything! Uh, he's got a permit, Quint! Since when does Santa Claus need a permit? One thing I'm always excited about when I make these episodes is seeing what a particular actor looks like when he's younger. Something I apparently didn't know about Robert's Blossom is that he was always 72 years old. Seriously, that's what it seems like. From the time he was only 34, he had already cemented his career in playing old people. Just look at the character names on his IMDb. Old Man with Dog, Aged Master, Old Man Marley, Old Wayne Taylor, Grandpa. He was a professional old man. A lot of the times, he played characters that were meant to be far older than he was, and he was always convincing. In this episode of Moonlighting, his actual age at the time was 64. I am 90 years old, born on the 4th of July, 1896. Or how about this small role in the 1971 film, The Hospital? On Monday morning, a patient named Guernsey, male, middle 70s, was admitted to the hospital complaining of chest pains. And here's a big one. He's 68 in this episode of Northern Exposure. Well, uh, arithmetic's not exactly my strong suit, Mr. Svenborg, where if you were 25 in 1909, that would make you... 108 years old. 108. That's right. Although to say that Roberts just played old people is a little unfair to say. It's not like he played characters that were just one-off dumb jokes. Nearly every character he played was nuanced and three-dimensional. He played nearly every kind of old person you can think of. Rather than continuing to tell you about his career in chronological order, I'm just going to put some of Blossom's major roles into certain categories. First, there's Crazy Old Man. The way Roberts looked, those piercing eyes and sunken cheeks, really helped him when he played these types of roles. Like the part of Wild Bob Cody, an unhinged prisoner of war in the film Slaughterhouse-Five. You, soldier, I know you don't ask. What's your name, soldier? Pilgrim, sir. Pilgrim, of course, I remember you! Damn fine rifles, but fine rifles, but Pilgrim, one of the best in the 451st. First in peace, first in war, and first, officer, just fine. Let go of me, Captain! Get your hands off me! And all this place is with his men! My men need me, and I'm staying with them! Don't worry, show old boys. Wild Bob is with you! I love the little bit of snot he has on his face. It's kind of unsettling and sad, really adds to the character. I also love this role as a hobo in Spielberg's film Always, in which Richard Dreyfus's character is dead and using Roberts as a conduit to speak to a friend of his. Who knows about crazy old hobos? Maybe they're like radio stations. Picking up voices from people who've gone off the air. So tune in, kid. This is one thing I really want to get through to you. Get through to you? With me, it was Dorinda. Dorinda. <gasps> when you meet the woman that you love. The woman you love. Not Dorinda, the woman he loves. Dorinda, the woman you love. After you're dead, you can never go back for her. Go back you can for never, her. You can never turn around, turn and, around. And, and, and do it right. Do it right. Do it right. That's not what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say, I've seen the signs. No exit, no passing, no parking. No U-turn. Yeah. I gotta go back and get my air attack card. 
Then there's his role as George LeBay in Christine. He's the most recent owner of a 1957 Plymouth Fury that kills its passengers. My asshole brother brought her back in September 57. That's when you got your new model year in September. Brand new she was. She had the smell of a brand new car. That's just about the finest smell in the world. Except maybe for pussy. On a much heavier note, he played a man in the late stages of Alzheimer's in an episode of Chicago Hope. What kind of a life does my father have? Hey, Pop, what kind of life is it? Hmm? What kind of life is it? Do you have uh, people to talk to? Do you have things to do? Hmm? Can you brush your teeth by yourself? Can you get dressed? Can you go to the freaking bathroom without someone having to clean up after you're dead? What kind of a future do you have? Continued physical deterioration, mental deterioration, isolation. But you see, you can't have your hand in your pants, Dad. That is not acceptable. I know that that is tops in entertainment, but you cannot have your hand in your pants, Dad. No, no! no. Dad. Dad. Although he had very little dialogue, he was heartbreaking to watch. And this scene later on is fantastic. His son is trying to get his father to overdose on medication so that he won't suffer anymore. Dad, I need you to swallow these pills. I really need you to put them in your mouth. Dad, please don't. 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 Dad, do not. Dad, stop it. No. Stop! Wow. Another kind of type Roberts played was the stubborn old man, the one that dislikes change. On the broad side of the spectrum, here he is as an abusive, Bible-beating father in an episode of a rebooted Twilight Zone series. Thus saith the Lord, I will deal with thee even as thou hast done. In the hay and dust with any filthy scamp that weeps and I. A wolf steals a lamb from the flock, eh? Well, my young sir, to me belongeth vengeance and restitution. I really liked this role as the father to a deaf girl in the made-for-TV movie Johnny Belinda. He doesn't know anything about deaf people, so he's just convinced that his daughter is some kind of feral animal that can't be helped. In this scene, he discovers her learning sign language in secret. So, this is where you've been keeping yourself. Has he touched you? Hey, wait a minute, we've been learning how to sign. That's all we're doing. Belinda, shut Look at him, wait a minute. Stop it away from her! You're all alike! You take and take! Well, not here! What are you waiting about? I've stopped. She's talking to you. She's talking. She's saying, Father, that's what we were doing. We were learning how to sign. Father. First time she's ever. How do you say daughter? Sign. It's two signs. Girl, baby. Together. Boy, didn't I do it right? She said that's good. You can teach her more. Her name. How to pray. Yes. Then he 
comes around. It's such a sweet moment. I think my favorite stubborn old man role that Roberts played was in the 1980 film Resurrection. After a terrible accident and a near-death experience, Ellen Burstyn comes back to rural Kansas with her emotionally distant father, played by Roberts. She eventually learns that she has the ability to heal people, which naturally makes some people feel uncomfortable. With all that going on, as well as Burstyn beginning a relationship with one of the locals, everything comes to a head with her father in this scene. You ain't nothing but trash. Always been, always will be. Oh, we're back to that again, are we? You got a lot of folks fooled around here. But I see what's been going on here. Uh, You're a hard, stupid old man without an ounce of love or understanding anywhere. And I am sick to death of trying to get you to love me. But then there's this tender scene later on where her father's dying and experiences the same visions she did in her near-death experience. What is it, Daddy? Tell me. Light. Hidden. Light. Yes, Daddy. Oh. Then there's another category I like to call the sad and regretful old man. This covers a lot of his work. In The Great Gatsby, he plays Gatsby's father, who shows up near the end of the film after hearing about his son's death. Is this... Is this... My son's house? In the film Escape from Alcatraz, he plays a prisoner named Doc who loves to paint. What's the flower? That's something inside me. They can't lock up with their bars and walls. But after the warden sees a painting he doesn't like, he takes away Doc's painting privileges. Painting's all I have! I'm sorry, Doc. He doesn't take it well. And then, of course, there's Old Man Marley in Home Alone. Let's talk about this for a minute. In my opinion, Old Man Marley is the most important character in Home Alone. Without this whole subplot, the movie would have been garbage. It almost was. At the same time, there were elements that didn't exist in the original script. The character of Marley, I don't think existed in the original screenplay. The movie originally ended with Kevin just saying, oh, just hung around, freeze frame. And we sort of worked together to bring that emotional side to it, as well as the intense sort of comedic side of it. Now wait, let's just think about that for a minute. Imagine the movie ending like that. What else did you do while we were away? Just hung around. And freeze frame. And some shitty Christmas song plays. With the addition of Marley's subplot, the film all of a sudden has a heart that it didn't have before, and our character actually learns something. Let's analyze this like Screenwriting 101. What is Kevin like at the beginning of the film? He hates his family, they're annoying, they treat him like a baby, he wants to be seen as an adult. The fact that he's nine years old is a technicality. If it were up to him, he would fast forward the next 11 years. So he makes a wish, and in his mind, his wish comes true. Everything's great at first, hooray, my family's gone, but it's a false victory. He begins to realize that he really is just a scared child. Not only that, but in being alone, he learns how much he really loves and cares for his family. But it takes more than just being alone to really learn this lesson. So as a character, what are two things that Kevin learns by the end of the film? Number one, that his family really is important. And number two, that despite what he thinks, he really is just a child and needs to conquer some fears in order to really take steps into adulthood. These fears manifest themselves on a small scale, like the furnace in the basement, and on a larger scale, like Old Man Marley, rumored to be a serial killer that kills people with his shovel and salts the roads with their corpses. And so comes the part in the film that Blake Snyder, writer of Save the Cat, would call the all-is-lost moment, 
It's a moment of false defeat. All aspects of the hero's life are in shambles. Wreckage abounds. No hope. Kevin regrets his wish. He takes a walk. He watches longingly into a nearby window where a happy family celebrates Christmas Eve. He now realizes what he's missing. Then, after the all is lost moment, comes the dark night of the soul moment. It's this part of the film where our hero, in the unlikeliest of places, learns something, reaches deep down within himself, and finds the inspiration to continue on. In Home Alone, Old Man Marley is that inspiration in the film's best scene. Been a good boy this year? I think so. You swear to it? No. Yeah, I had a feeling. Well, this is the place to be if you're feeling bad about yourself. It is? I think so. Are you feeling bad about yourself? No. You want to know the real reason why I'm here right now? Sure. I came to hear my granddaughter sing. And I can't come and hear her tonight. You have plans? No. I'm not welcome. At church? Oh, you're always welcome at church. I'm not welcome with my son. As a result of Kevin's conversation with Marley, he overcomes the irrational fear about him that he once had. All of this, in my opinion, inspires Kevin to go back home and set up the booby traps. When I was a kid watching this movie, I always assumed that Kevin had already premeditated all of this. Now when I watch it, I think that this very scene inspires Kevin to reach down within himself and find the courage he didn't know he had, which is where this line comes from. This is my house. I have to defend it. That's a line that says, I'm not just gonna sit around and hide under the bed while these assholes rob me blind. Plus, this is what my family would have wanted me to do. I'm gonna do this for them. Now back to the scene. A nice twist to this particular Dark Knight of the Soul moment is that the source of Kevin's inspiration, Old Man Marley, actually learns something too. You can be a little old for a lot of things. You're never too old to be afraid. That's true. I've always been afraid of our basement. It's dark, there's weird stuff down there. And it smells funny, that sort of thing. It's bothered me for years. The basements are like that. Then I made myself go down there to do some laundry, and I found out it's not so bad. All this time I've been worrying about it, but if you turn on the lights, it's no big deal. What's your point? My point is you should call your son. What if he won't talk to me? At least you'll know. Then you can stop worrying about it, and he won't have to be afraid anymore. I don't care how mad I was, I talked to my dad, especially around the holidays. I don't know. Just give it a shot, for your granddaughter anyway. I'm sure she misses you, and the presents. You better run along home where you belong. You think about what I said, all right? Okay. What about you? Me? Yeah, you and your son. We'll see what happens. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Then, after all the hijinks, the family comes home, jokes around with Kevin, and then we have this great emotional payoff scene. moment and Robert's Blossom plays it wonderfully. Now think about what this movie would have been without all of this. It's a good thing they kept rewriting the script. Moving on from Home Alone, I don't want to end this episode without talking about Blossom's only lead role in a film, Deranged. Or there's the alternate title, Deranged Confessions of a Necrophile. This is a ridiculous, gross, campy horror film that came out in 1974. Very loosely based on a true story, Robert's Blossom plays Ezra, a farmer who takes care of his bedridden old mother. One day she dies, gruesomely, but Ezra doesn't want to accept her death. As a result, he decides to dig up her body, bring her back home, and pretends that everything's alright. It has some genuine horror moments, but there are really funny moments too. 
Well, we're just kind of worried about you, that's all. And, well, we thought it would be nice if you could meet someone who... And I'd be glad to introduce you if you wanted. You know, someone nice who could be a companion for you, that's all. Nope. No. I don't trust him. You don't trust who, Ez? You know, girls and stuff. You're damn right. Don't you know any girls you could trust, Ezra? No. Nope. Except my mother. Maureen Selby. Say, I can trust her. I know I can trust her. Why do you think you can trust her, Ez? Oh, because she's fat. I know I can trust her. She's fat. Well, then why don't you give her a call? Roberts plays his character the same way. There are times when he's genuinely creepy and foreboding. Then there are times when what he's doing or saying is really funny in a dark way, and you sympathize with him a little bit. You actually get the sense that he's probably a little mentally challenged. I love this scene where he's eating a chicken wing and talking to his mother's corpse. It really sums up the tone of the movie, I think. She is fat, Mama. Just like you said. But I like that fat. Big old arms, place just hanging down. <laughs> I like that. The legs too, big and round, like big old drumsticks. She's got a cute old belly, and as cute as can be. <laughs> of course, I'd hate to get stuck in all that fat and not be able to get out. So naturally, I'll take some protection along just in case. You know, the only thing that bothers me, I don't think she's, uh, you know, uh, all there. In upstairs. You know what I mean? It's a great performance on Blossom's part, and if you're in the mood to watch a fun, weird, obscure horror movie with your friends one night, check it out. Roberts Blossom continued acting after Home Alone, Doc Hollywood, Quick and the Dead. The last film he did was a children's film called Balloon Farm in 1999. Afterwards, he retired and wrote poetry until he died in 2011. I wish I had more information about who this man really was that I could share with you, but there's not much out there that's readily available. There was a documentary about him called Full Blossom, The Life of Poet Slash Actor Roberts Blossom, but I can't find a copy of it anywhere. Over a month ago, I tried emailing and calling the director and producers, but no one's gotten back to me. There is, at the very least, a five-minute trailer to the documentary uploaded by the director to YouTube. We get hints of who he was, and it's really interesting. I think of myself as a poet actor, or as a performance poet. He thinks a lot. I mean, he's really a thinking poet, a thinking man, thinking actor. We were in Close Encounters, and uh, he got us out. Uh, we were sitting in the grass, and he came out to talk to us. I was sitting behind him. The others were there, and he, so he was talking to them. He was back turned to me. Suddenly, I saw he wasn't Spielberg at all. He was Vishnu right standing there talking. I was amazed. It's the only time I ever had that impression of him, but that's the impression I had. He has sent me telepathic messages before um, from New York or California, wherever he was, to my home in Illinois. Um, apparently, according to him, I received the messages and responded to him. Uh, and he made, you know, judgments based on what my response was. And all this happened without me ever knowing that that, that happened, yeah. Time began as a system of correlating events that are all eternal. Life began as a means of meeting the challenge of every, a microfilm library in different languages of time and space. Long, long ago I wrote that. Came to me. Underwater. I want to know more, don't you? I'm so irritated at the director for not providing a way for people to watch this. If anyone out there finds a way to get a copy of this documentary, please let me know. In the end, Roberts Blossom was a truly intuitive actor. 
He always brought depth and humanity to his characters. Every character he's ever played, I felt something for, even in the smallest way. But even after watching all these projects he did, I'll always remember him for this moment at the end of Home Alone, as I'm sure a lot of us will. If my definition of Christmas was translated to a jumbled montage of images, this scene is one of them. Rest in peace, Mr. Blossom, and Merry Christmas, everyone. Thanks for watching.